Welcome back to the lecture optimization in uh, machine learning. Um, today we're going to look at nonlinear programs and the Lagrangian um, in the general context. So Lagrangians for general constraint optimization will be one of the learning goals. We're going to learn um, about um, a geometric intuition for Lagrangian duality and properties and uh, um, examples. Uh, of the Lagrangian for general problems. Okay, so last time in the previous lectures, we introduced the general linear program of the form, as you can see, C transpose T, so minimize C transpose uh, as uh, X, subject uh, to the general inequality constraint A, e AX uh, small equal B and linearity constraints GX equals H. And we discussed at the end how its dual formulation can be related to this function L uh, of the form where we have L of X, <clears throat> the parameters alpha and beta, where you simply say, okay, so this is our objective function here, C transpose X, right? Plus alpha transpose AX minus B for the linear inequality plus uh, beta transpose uh, GX minus H for the general uh, inequality constraint. So we saw this function naturally emerging uh, in the context of the dual formulation of our primal problem here um, as depicted here. So as we heard in previous lectures, right, the general constraint optimization problem, nothing needs to be linear here. So usually we have a function f of x that we want to minimize subject to K um, inequality constraints and L affine or linear constraints H, right? And this is in the homogeneous form. So here is all zeros and these functions here, um, the value of X uh, of in the, these individual functions should attain a value small equal zero in this constraint and here should be equal to zero. And these functions, let's assume they could be smooth um, but they are definitely not necessarily linear. And when we looked at the previous form of, of this function L that we derived for linear programs, it would be tempting to mirror this construction sort of, and also define now this function L for general constraint optimization problems, right? Where you say, okay, so we have our, now a general um, minimization function F, and we add multipliers, alpha and beta, now individually to each of our nonlinear um, constraint functions. So as we will see later, this construction, which is now called the Lagrange function uh, or Lagrangian associated with this primal nonlinear optimization problem, is actually a valid construction and will be key to defining Lagrangian duality and the multipliers alpha i and uh, beta beta i will be called Lagrange multipliers okay so this is the end goal so this is why this is important uh, uh, we're going to learn and why this is useful um, but of course uh, before diving into this general recipe, if you will, we can also think about more direct ways, right? So similar to linear programs that can be thought of or sometimes solved by sort of solving a linear system, you can think of that certain constraint problems can be simply solved by, uh, by calculus or algebra. And so if you consider, for instance, this example, this is a nonlinear optimization problem. We want to minimize 2 minus x squared subject to an inequality constraint, x minus 1 equals 0. So here you don't need a numerical method or a complicated recipe. You can simply ask yourself, OK, when you uh, resolve this one dimensional uh, equality, you realize, oh, OK, so x can only be 1. And then, then you insert it into your objective function and you realize the minimum is attained at one. Okay, so that's that's uh, simple. Let's look at a more complicated nonlinear problem where we have in the minimization here a square, but also in the constraint we have square functions. So this is 
most likely a non-convex uh, function, but the question is, can we still sort of solve it in a, in a, in a direct way? And here we can do classical substitution, right? So we can look at the equality constraint. We can say, okay, let's express our x1 square by one minus uh, x2 square and insert it back into the uh, objective function. So then we get minus two plus x1 square plus x2 square will be, by replacing our x1 square, for instance, will become this term. And um, collecting all the x squared terms, we realize it's going to be minus 1 plus uh, x2 squared. So what we did through this uh, inequality constraint substitution is we turned this two-dimensional problem into a one-dimensional unconstrained problem, right? There is no constraint there anymore. And we, we quickly see by looking at this that the minimum is attained at x2 equals 0, right? And so when we plug this back into our constraint, we realize that x1 right, can take the value plus or minus 1. So you get two possible solutions, so it's a, a non-convex problem. Okay, these are these and other examples are sort of trivial examples where we can look at the optimization problem and, and, and sort of directly solve them. But that's not helpful in general. And so here comes uh, the Lagrangian to the rescue. And so what we ask ourselves now, is there sort of a general recipe for solving these constrained nonlinear optimization problems, potentially convex or non-convex? Um, is there a recipe? And can we understand this sort of geometrically by looking at a simple example? And ultimately, when we do this, so how does this relate to this Lagrange function that we learned about uh, in linear programming at the very end, and I now introduced um, in the beginning, right? And for this purpose, so one interesting example is here, the classical milkmaid problem, uh, as introduced by uh, Stuart uh, Jensen in his introduction to Lagrange multipliers. And uh, it's a cute little geometric example that essentially uh, gives you the, the gist of, of the Lagrangian construction. All right. So uh, what we assume here is, so say you have a milkmaid that is sent to the field um, to get sort of the day's milk. So she's at a specific position and she wants to go to the cow to actually get the milk. But she wants to do this as quickly as possible, right? But before uh, going uh, to uh, the cow, she needs to rinse her bucket first. And this is uh, typically done at a nearby river. And so here's the geometric problem, right? So here's the, the milkmaid or the milk boy and uh, wants to go to the cow. The cow is positioned here and it wants to do this as quickly as possible while actually needing to go to the river first and rinse the bucket. All right. So what we would like to identify now in this optimization problem right, is how do we get to uh, the river as quickly as possible and then to the cow? All right. So how do we do this? Let's define sort of the river here as sort of an implicit function where we say the x1, x2 coordinates of the river it's a function h of x1 and x2 where it's equal zero. So if you will, like the level set here where this function is zero, that defines sort of the curve of the river. Okay. And, okay, so in, in, in simple mathematics, we want to have sort of a direct line to the river and the touching point we call p. And from the river, we then directly go to the cow. All right. So if you define the point where the milkmaid or the milk boy uh, is actually standing with, uh, as M, this point here P and the cow C, then what we would like to minimize is the distance from M to P plus P to C. Right? Okay, great. And so this is now our objective function. Could be also a different objective function, but here is it's in terms of distances, right? 
And our constraint, if you will, in this problem is really this function h, which is not linear, obviously here, um, defining the river as h of x1 and x2 uh, being equal to zero. So for instance, this could be a polynomial or, or some other uh, function. Great. So as we learned, so if we formulate this in, if we will, in the primal form, we can say, like minimize this distance function here, subject to the constraint uh, that h of x, x1 and x2 is equal to zero. Super. So that's our uh, optimization problem. And so now we can do a little geometry, right? So we can say, okay, so the if we look at the position here m, and we draw concentric circles uh, of various distances, then these lines would be sort of the distance you uh, you can reach uh, within that distance. So this would be a circle. So you can say, for instance, okay, what's the distance here to the river? And then I would touch. Uh, P at the smallest circle that sort of touches this river here, and that would be our distance P from M. That would be the shortest distance along to the river. Okay, that's easy. But right, we want to go uh, sort of to the cow afterwards. So our function is really the distance going to the river and then going to the cow. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> we can do a little bit more geometry and we're going to realize that for any sort of tri triangle with two focal points, so F1 and F2, say like our M and our uh, C, the distance um, to this ellipsoid here, uh, these two um, distances here, are exactly identical uh, to 2A, where A is here, um, the long side of this ellipsoid. So we have an ellipsoid here. Here is the center of the ellipsoid. And every point on this ellipsoid here uh, is described by the distance uh, from P to F2, the second focal point, and the first focal point. So that's just a geometric fact. So this is then essentially um, uh, the, the distance uh, constant distance uh, of uh, of the ellipse. All right. So if we plug that back in, right, you can see like we can now draw not uh, circles, but these ellipsoids are around our two focal points. And we know that the distance traveled between the foci while touching sort of a point on the ellipsoid, that's a constant, all right? So again, so we know like whenever we start here and then go to a point on the ellipsoid and then uh, go to, uh, to the cow, this is sort of the ellipsoid describes uh, distances, uh, constant distances. All right, so if we know that now, we can again geometrically say, great, what's sort of the solution to our problem? Well, the solution to our problem is really finding the smallest ellipsoid with these focal points here that will touch the river. Right? So we blow this uh, ellipsoid up and eventually we touch it. And this is our touching point P. And then we know exactly um, the distance um, as for instance here depicted would be 25 meters. All right, so this is the geometric construction, but we can learn a lot from it because we have a geometric intuition now about this problem. So look at uh, the ellipsoid here. It touches that point at the constraint function h. Okay, what does this uh, really mean in terms of mathematics? Right, so this is uh, the optimum point is described by this touching of the of of the ellipsoid, and that means that at that point it's tangential, right, to the riverbank. So it's really so the geometric description here. And and what does that mean in terms of mathematics? Well, if it's tangential here, right, it mean it means that it needs to have sort of the same normal at that point 
like as uh, the, the function h describing the river. And uh, remember from multivariate calculus, right, the gradient of the function h here is exactly that normal to the surface or here to this line um, at this point. So now we have sort of a criterion uh, that mathematical criterion that tells us when uh, th this touching point um, is actually attained. So we have two functions here, right? Our, our distance functions f, and we know it's tangential to the river. We have here um, the normal described uh, by the river function is the gradient of, of h here. And so we know, since it's tangential, then the gradient of f of our actual minimization function should also be, should have the same uh, gradient, right? So it's tangential here, so it should be exactly the same direction. Modulo sum scaling, right? It, it doesn't necessarily need to be the same length of the normal, but the direction need to be the same. And so this is now, in this context, this is the origin, if you will, of the Lagrangian um, multiplier for solving this optimization problem. So what we can set up now is really a condition uh, describing this point P. So at the point P, the gradient of our function needs to be the same as the gradient of our uh, equality constraint, modulo some scaling, and the scaling is called the Lagrange multiplier. So now we dis discussed here everything in terms of gradient because that gives us this condition of tangentiality where we hit this point. Okay, so in order to solve now our problem, uh, we can simply say, okay, great. So we have now two conditions, namely uh, our optimal point needs to be on the river, but also the gradient needs to match up to a uh, scalar um, Lagrange multiplier beta. Of course, we can now bring this also on the other side because the beta here uh, is a scalar, so it doesn't really matter what sign it has. So we can flip the sign, we bring it on the left-hand side. Okay, so now we have a, a, a system of equations here. Right? Okay, and so if if we look if you look at this condition here, now we can say well. If we, in the first place, had defined a function L, remember, so, so our Lagrange function, as f of x plus beta times h of x, right? And remember the definition of a stationary point where we always, for any function, if we want to find a stationary point, say a local minimum in your non-convex function, we always said like, well, okay, we need to set the gradient of that function, right, to zero. So if, we, if you look at this function here now, and you compute the gradient with respect to x, and then with respect to beta, you know um, the condition for the optimum needs to be that at the point x star in beta and point x star here in beta, needs to be zero, it's a necessary condition. And now if we look at the gradient uh, of L here, it's exactly the conditions we derived geometrically from before. So it's the gradient of F plus beta times the gradient of H. And of course, still our constraint here uh, is still the original constraint, H of X, right, uh, is zero. And that's the gradient with respect to beta of this function, right? So there the, is the constant is is the function h of x. Okay. Sometimes, so in in, in books you also uh, get the the general definition here with a minus sign. Both conventions are sort of used, um, but then simply the uh, the sign of beta is different. But what's important is of course the tangentiality uh, um, uh, property. Uh, which is uh, expressed by the equality modulo of this, this scalar. 
Okay. So this is another way of looking at the Lagrange function. So why we do this Lagrange function and get sort of these conditions that make sense geometrically. And the important point here is that this is really doesn't doesn't depend on our f being, for instance, this ellipsoid uh, construction. This f could be uh, extremely nonlinear, but this condition uh, still holds. Right. Okay. And so the method can also be extended, of course, to as we see in for linear programs also to inequality constraints. And so you get another set of Lagrange multipliers then for the inequality constraint. And then um, you can think about now the, the general nonlinear geometry of the problem. Right? So if, for instance, the optimal solution is inside the constraint region, then it means sort of the constraint is anyhow inactive and our Lagrange multipliers can be set to zero. Right? So there is nothing that happens at the at the boundary, so we can set this to zero. The constraint is not active, so it doesn't contribute to the uh, Lagrangian. And if the optimal solution lies on the boundary, right? So, for instance, in the inequality constraint uh, g of x larger or smaller or equal to zero, so it would mean like uh, g of x is zero. Then the negative gradient uh, uh, points in the opposite direction of the gradient uh, g of x. Right? So if you have here this uh, nonlinear region described by your, uh, your inequality constraint, then uh, this, this would be satisfied. OK. And so this is sort of the geometric intuition of our milkmaid or milk boy problem where we saw like, okay, we have need to have this touching, this tangential property. This means that our gradients up to a scalar need to be the same. Um, this can sort of be uh, the reason, or this is the reason why this uh, construction of this Lagrangian uh, is, is also useful. And so hence, as we uh, hypothesized in the beginning, our Lagrangian in, in general terms, associated with a, a general minimization problem f of x can be indeed written as f of x plus the sum of our inequality constraint and our equality constraints. Okay. And so now we can say, like, okay, so we have this Lagrangian now, and we can write this problem now if we, if we do now the following uh, construction where we say, okay, so remember our upper bound uh, of the dual and so on. If we say now, okay, so we want to maximize L with respect to our Lagrange multiplier and then minimize X, if we write it like in, in this form, we can show that this is uh, indeed the exact equivalent formulation, albeit more complicated, to our original primary problem, namely minimizing f of x subject to the constraints. So why is that? So we have the inner maximization with respect to the uh, multipliers and then the outer minimization with respect to x, okay? Okay. So let's again, for simplicity, assume we have uh, no, uh, 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 equality constraint and just a single inequality constraint. Okay, so what's happening here? So assume that our x does break the inequality constraint. So in this case, uh, g of x larger equals zero, right? Then if we maximize this with respect to alpha, we get the maximum of f of x plus alpha g of x uh, is in infinity, right? Because we can pick sort of alpha infinity to drive this absolutely to infinity. So that's sort of the same, right? But uh, if otherwise, if a g of x is small equal zero, right? 
we have our Lagrangian, we maximize now over alpha, over all positive alphas. We look at this, what does that mean? Okay, we maximize with respect to alpha, so our f of x is not affected by it. But if we want to maximize this, and our g of x is small a equals zero, then this maximum can only be attained if we set alpha to zero. So because any uh, alpha g of x small a equals zero is really for any alpha should be larger than zero. And our g of x is zero if then alpha is zero. All right. So this means um, that really this inner maximization, say here over alpha, really drives then this f of x, uh, re uh, really drives this constraint to zero. And we have our f of x left. So our albeit more complicated way of writing the primary problem would be minimizing over x and then inner maximization over these parameters. All right, so this is the Lagrange function formulation of the primal problem. And so we can now uh, do this ex so-called extended function. I say like, okay, great. So if our constraint here, our inequality constraint is not satisfied, we have the extension to infinity. We've seen this, by the way, also for linear programs. Right? And otherwise, so if the constraint is fulfilled, we have our usual objective function. And this is exactly our original formulation, right? And of course, uh, you can have a similar argument for the for the constraint h of x2, and it also applies to multiple um, constraints. All right. So now we can put this into action, right? So uh, for instance, consider sort of a generic uh, quadratic program. So we left the sphere of linear programs, right? And say we have here a Q uh, being symmetric, potentially also positive definite, but not necessarily. We don't make assumption about convexity here. So um, subject to our uh, linear equality constraint here, C of X equals D. Um, and in this case, we can bring it on, on the left-hand side and say like cx minus d is equal to zero. So this is our equality constraint. This is our objective function. And so the Lagrange function associated with this primal problem would be then simply quadratic plus linear with the Lagrange multiplier. And the Lagrangian has not only the original primal variables, but also the Lagrange multiplier. Uh, yeah, as an argument. All right. So now, if we want to do minimization, um, of course, we can say, like, okay, we, how is it about the stationary points of the Lagrangian? Right. So we can say, like, okay, what's the gradient of this function with respect uh, to our um, now two arguments, x and, and beta? So we uh, we form uh, uh, the gradient here, and lo and behold, what we see here, the gradient with respect to x becomes now this uh, linear form, uh, qx, right, uh, the gradient of our quadratic form, plus c transpose beta. Um, and with uh, uh, respect to our Lagrange multiplier, this becomes simply the, the constraint. So we recover here the constraint, and here we have uh, also a linear linear form. So this is really now a linear system of n plus p equations, right? Which we can simply write down now as okay. So this is our gradient applied to our variables must be equal to uh, zero and d, right? So. For quadratic programs, uh, finding uh, stationary points of the Lagrangian function indeed corresponds now to the solution of a linear system. And, you know, that can be solved efficiently and stably with your favorite matrix decomposition scheme. You can use conjugate gradient or you can do an explicit decomposition uh, of it. So that's pretty cool. 
So like this, we find stationary points of the Lagrangian and they are associated obviously to stationary points of uh, the primal problem. How can we do for typical problems? How can we solve in statistics? How can we do Lagrangian uh, uh, functions for, say, the lasso? And so remember, in the original formulation by Tip Shirani, the lasso was this quadratic form here. So we want to do least squares um, with respect to our parameter theta, subject to the constraint that our L1 norm of theta is smaller equal a uh, constant t. And so t is sort of our tuning parameter. And so now, if if you want to formulate this uh, as uh, in in a Lagrangian form, then you simply apply what we learned, namely, so equivalently, this is the minimum over your parameters here, and the maximum over your uh, Lagrange multiplier. And you have here the original uh, uh, objective function. You have uh, your Lagrange multiplier times your inequality constraint. All right. So as you can see here, nothing depends on T anymore. But of course, it depends on alpha. And so if we left away the T here, you have sort of, uh, you can clearly see that this is already the penalized form, right, in here uh, of the lasso that we knew where we typically called this alpha um, the penalty parameter. But here we still have a maximization over alpha and then a minimization over theta. So simply because this looks the same, it, it is not really the same. Um, and so the explicit derivation right now of what is the min max of this and then associated with that also the dual, that was a big breakthrough. Uh, in statistics in, in 2000, uh, done by Osborne and others. So here's the link. So you can really do the explicit der derivation of the dual of the lasso uh, using this Lagrangian formulation. So how does this actually work? So here still, remember, this is the primal form simply in this min-max form of the Lagrangian. How can we, how can we do the dual? Well, it turns out that the dual of the above, like really general formulation with the Lagrangian is when we reverse maximization and minimization. So if we have now the max on the outer side and the minimum inside, right, then this is really uh, the dual problem associated, the Lagrangian dual problem associated with the primal problem uh, in the beginning. And the function g, again, as in, in linear programming too, right? Um, the uh, dual function g that we want to maximize right, is really the minimization over x with respect to your Lagrangian here. Okay. So that's pretty cool because now we have this dual function here. And we want to maximize this, right? And uh, recall that we said that, oh, the dual is sort of gives us lower bounds to our primal problem. And so now we have the dual function. And now you can think about, okay, so maybe this function can be um, optimized more efficiently. So for instance, we, we hold alpha and beta constant and then optimize over x. This is now an unconstrained problem because we have no uh, constraints anymore. And then we need to maximize over alpha and beta. So this is the definition of duality in, 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 in the general way. And it's bare similarity, right, to the duality in linear programming. Um, and of course, for LPs, this is exactly the same. Uh, definition, but it is uh, now more general because it imbues many more functions than just linear functions. What's interesting, there are a couple of properties that are interesting of, of, of the dual problem. So the dual problem here is always convex, 
Okay, so even if your original function is non-convex, the dual always is. And like in Lagrangian duality, it, it's so that weak duality always applies. It means if you solve this function g now to optimality, so you maximize this g, right, you will always get a lower bound on f of x. How good that lower bound is, that's unclear. But at least uh, this inequality holds. And remember, we call this sort of weak duality. So there, there might be a gap between the maximum over G and the uh, minimum over F. Now, in addition, and in statistics, uh, we have this often, right? If the primal problem is actually convex, we do have strong duality in general. And, and so that means that so maximizing your Lagrangian dual will give you the optimal value of the primal problem. And so what are sort of these conditions when this is satisfied? These conditions are typically called regularity conditions or some, some are called Slater's condition. They must be fulfilled, and there is there there are uh, cool resources on what are these conditions and um, how to check them in order to have sort of strong duality, such that we can, for instance, use maximization over the dual rather than minimization over the primal problem. Okay. So in summary, so what we learned today is a very powerful recipe, uh, namely uh, forming a Lagrangian function of your original primal problem, realizing that using the Lagrangian, we have an equivalent formulation of the primal problem, and we quite easily can form a dual problem that gives us sort of at least a lower bound uh, on our complicated, potentially complicated primal problem. And we know that the, the dual is always convex. And in, in the context of convex functions and sort of convex constraints and affine constraints, equality constraints, we even get under certain conditions strong duality. So meaning that we can solve an equivalent uh, problem that pushes up and up to eventually reach uh, the minimum. And we also saw that to get stationary points of this Lagrangian sometimes uh, ends up in something like solving a linear system, like we saw for the uh, quadratic problem with uh, linear constraints. The geometric intuition we developed comes really from this tangential, prop tangential property of where the gradient of your objective function f needs to align with the gradient of your constraint function in general. And so from the geometric interpretation of the ellipsoid touching sort of this river, we saw that, oh, if we actually form the Lagrangian view the way we did, uh, we end up that in the stationary conditions, we're going to get exactly these uh, geometrically derived um, conditions. And so that's a good mental picture to have in mind. Where do these equations come from? Why? How, how can we um, interpret them uh, geometrically?